What kind of compression ratio do you build your hot rod for? It's an interesting question and I want to talk about it because this is I think the smartest way to build a hot rod these days. Especially as we never know what gas prices are going to be these days. And back when I was a kid, gas prices when you went up from the different grades, they were about 10 or 15 cents. Now that it's 50 cents per gallon per grade, you're talking a dollar per gallon more expensive for the basic stuff versus the premium stuff. And I think it makes an interesting conversation about if you're building a hot rod and you're building a motor today, what compression ratio do you build it for? What fuel type do you build it for and why? Now, I obviously have my 1979 AMC Spirit on the, uh, on the, on the rack here. This is an AMC 304. Um, it is now a five-speed converted car, and it gets about 19 to 20 miles per gallon as I drive it, uh, which is pretty solid, especially for a hot rod old, back in the old days. I've never even tested my fuel economy now that it's EFI swapped, but it's definitely even better than it was when it was carbureted. So um, I want to use this and another one of my vehicles as an explanation, as a visual as well. But I want to show some people underneath this car because a lot of people have never seen this, and they have some questions about it. So still has the AMC rear end, still has the factory sway bar, which was pretty neat, pretty rare back in these days, and it's a beefy rear sway bar. Um, factory diff is leaking just a tad bit. We, this is a unit that we had taken out of another car because we wanted to swap to a Posi unit, and the one that came with my car was an open rear diff. Uh, it's got a, I think it's like a 287, I believe is the gear that's in this thing. Um, which works out really, really well with the five speed on the highway. Flowmaster exhaust, obviously we haven't taken it all the way back, so it dumps underneath the body, which is not terribly loud. Also, I don't remember, I apologize who made the comment about, um, if those are Flowmaster mufflers, they're on backwards. They are Flowmasters, as you can see it says Flowmaster there. Um, but, find a light here. You can see there it says inlet. And inlet. So these are center inlet, offset outlet. Not the biggest exhaust in the world. Don't need it. Don't want to pay for it. Uh, and realistically speaking, a lot of people over, over exhaust size their cars. Uh, this doesn't need three inch exhaust, it's a 304. So you can see some of the, the bracing we did in the floors here. Um, we've done some here and then some up there in the front in the tote area to be able to add a little bit of extra rigidity to this car, uh, especially given it was missing some a few chunks of floor here and there. You can see we've, uh, we've done some upgrades there. Now this is obviously probably not the greatest way to do this. Um, that's my inside passenger floor. And I actually lost a pair of uh, Raycon earbuds through that hole on uh, on a road trip once before. I set it down and it literally just fell out and went out and down the highway. So we'll probably finish the floors at some point in time. Maybe, we'll see. Um, X-pipe exhaust. For those who have asked about the D5 swap, here's some video for you. That's how we did our uh, our cross member on the T5. Hopefully that helps. This is a pipes uh, X pipe. I've used a lot of pipe products, and I'll be honest, I'm actually kind of considering taking these Flowmasters off and putting some of the pipe stuff on, or at least testing it. Um, for something coming up, if you guys want to see some exhaust comparisons and that kind of thing. Um, in front of this car, again, AMC 304. You can see it's got some leaks here and there. We put this motor together a long time ago at this point. It's got a lot of work. It's got a lot of places. All the steering components are brand new. The brakes are brand new. Well, they were brand new when I put the car together. Um, all this, all the running gear stuff is all new. Engine is a, a 60 over 304, uh, like eight and a half to one compression, maybe a little bit more than that on uh, cast iron heads. Uh, pretty small-ish camshaft, nothing real crazy. Um, it was, it's designed as a cruiser. It's not meant to be a drag race car. It's not ready 
really meant to be anything crazy. I, I drive the hell out of this thing. And that's why we built it the way we built it, to, to make it something that I could just get in and drive no matter what, and I could drive it no matter where, and not have to worry about fuel prices and stuff. Now, obviously, we're gonna do a little bit more with this car um, and get a little bit more aggressive with the next engine that's going into it. And then we're also making plans for the next engine after that that goes into it. But at the moment, this is what this is what I built for. It's, a, like I said, a, a, a standard compression so I can run it on 87 octane without any problems. And uh, for something I'm gonna put a lot of mileage on, makes a ton of sense. Also, honestly, it makes some pretty good noise. For an AMC 304, it makes pretty good noises. Most people never really give the 304 AMCs any kind of love when you've got like small block Fords and small block Chevys that get all the love. The small displacement AMC V8s just don't get any love, which is sad because it's a it's a pretty solid car. I think it made, I don't know what it was, 200 and something on the on the dyno at the tires, which was respectable. Not anything to write home about, but it's it's respectable. But this is a nice feature because I can literally just get in it and drive it wherever I want to. I don't have to worry about what kind of fuel I'm going to be running. And at 20 miles to the gallon, it makes sense for me to be able to save, what, it's like a 15 gallon tank. So I'm saving a dollar per tank. I'm saving lunch every single tank. 15 bucks a tank makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Also, one of the neat features is because of the fact that I've built this thing to run on low octane fuels, is I have headroom if I wanted to add boost to it. In the case of adding boost to it, all I need to do is just add octane to it. Let's say I put a supercharger on this thing, which is not entirely out of the question. If I put a supercharger and add eight pounds of boost to it, roughly speaking, I could still very easily add, run that on normal 91, 92, 93 octane with zero issues, none at all because your dynamic compression is not going to be affected that much with half a, uh, a bar of compression. It's not. You know, you're going to end up at like 9.2, 9.3 to 1, which is still super easy to run on pump gas. And that's the idea. Make it something you can drive a lot. We had a lot of questions about that on the Oldsmobile build, about why would you build it to run on such crappy gasoline? And the answer is multifold. But a big portion of it is the fact that you're gonna drive the car, build it on the cheapest stuff you can drive. Have a good time with it. It's gonna make piles of power anyway. The amount of performance you're gonna get for moving from a nine and a half to one or an eight and a half to one to nine and a half to one compression, in most cases, is very minimal. You're not gonna get a gigantic amount of power increase for the amount of cost that you're gonna be adding, incurring at the gas pump. Make sense? Now, let me grab the other car. I'm going to pull my Pontiac in here real quick and take a look at that, and I'll show you what's going on with that car, and we'll talk about what that one's built for and how it is. Do you love this car yet? I, I still really love this car, and I would really love to take it out rally racing because it was such a good time, but I just won't do it. I won't do it. I'm going to let her do the streetcar life. I might as well show you the under the hood of this thing as well because everybody loves this. My incredibly American valve covers. My good friend Jonathan Kinney did those for me. Again, cast iron heads, uh, performer intake manifold, nothing crazy. And an Asus Classic. He applies to them. You can see my uh, command center over here. It's just basically like a uh, surge tank for fuel injection. So I've got a mechanical fuel pump down there that feeds this and then this feeds to my fuel injection. Nice thing is if any of this stuff goes wrong, I could just, or if I want to change it, I literally just unbolt, turn this off, take that off, put my carburetor back on, and run a fuel line from my fuel pump straight to the carburetor, and you're back to the carburetor. Not that I foresee that ever needing to be an issue, but it is what it is. Hey, you see, we uh, went ahead and flipped that there, so you get the extra horsepower there. Still working on that tune, on that throttle down. It's getting better. Getting better. Hey, 
And no, I still haven't put door hinges on this thing yet. Yes, it still needs door hinges. Rain, rain, stay away. I got some toys to play with today. Ah, got water in my car. That's how much it's been raining here. That's annoying. All right, baby. I know you've been sleeping for a little while. I just need you to wake up. Come on, baby. Give me a moment. She's angry at me. Honey, I'm sorry. Sorry I've been ignoring you. Give me a second, we'll get it pulled inside. This is my 1970 Le Mans uh, Pontiac 455. This is still carbureted, still quad jet powered. As you can see there, it is still cast iron headed as well. Uh, this is an AC car. It will actually be recently or in the very near future have some more AC uh, work and the pulleys will be upgraded here shortly with a serpentine system. But old school stuff, steering, suspension, basically everything is old school other than some shocks. I haven't done really anything else with this car. Uh, we did upgrade to the front disc brakes, but otherwise she's about as old school as it gets. Uh, Flotec headers, turbo 350 uh, BNM transmission. Again, another pipe, X pipe. This goes back to the pipe violator series exhaust. The full pipe violator kit see my floor in there. Pretty solid car though, all, all things considered. Came out of uh, mountains of Virginia. Don't even have box control arms back here. Pipe Trans Am tips. car. Now that one is built nine and a half to one compression cast iron head, which is more or less about the ragged edge of what you're going to be able to do on a cast iron headed car. Um, you can get on a really ragged edge if you really, really want to, but on 91, 92, 93 octane, nine and a half to one compression is about as high as I'll be willing to go. You could go a little bit higher, but the benefits are marginal. But I do need to run premium gas in that car, so that one does require me to drive on a dollar a gallon more expensive gas than my AMX does. And I built this car about, uh, I think I built that engine about eight years ago. Uh, Joe Coben actually built that when he was over at Performance Research. Uh, and those guys, uh, he's actually moved on, now he works for Steve Morris Racing Engines. Uh, but they've been doing Pontiac stuff for a long period of time. I actually just got off the phone a couple of days ago with another gentleman who just had a exact same, or very similar build done over at Performance Research. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a fantastic build. It's a fantastic way to build things. But it doesn't leave me a lot of room for expansion. It doesn't leave me the ability to be able to do much more than what I already have there. I do have that motor choked down quite a bit with the intake manifold that I have on it. Um, it would definitely be able to make a lot more power if I decided I really wanted to wake it up and get aggressive with it. Um, it's a full two and a half inch exhaust from pipes. I could go to three inch if I really want to. I could probably pick up some power there. It's got a 336 rear end gear in it. If I really wanted to focus this car on 
racing more than driving, it would be a good idea to put some money into the rear end and go with a, a more aggressive rear gear. It's a posi, but it's great for highway mileage. Now this car gets like 14 and a half miles to the gallon uh, with the quadrajet that's on there, which is pretty stand, which is pretty solid for a hot rod. But factor in the fact that I'm paying a dollar more per gallon, again, that's 15 bucks per tank or so. That's lunch, man. That's cheeseburger. Then I put thousands of miles on this car. So over the time, maybe I should have built it the other direction. I don't know. And if I want to put a supercharger on this thing, I can't. Unless I want to go 85, which you know me, I'm not going to do. So there's no there's no headroom for being able to build something more, to be able to make more power out of this thing without really redoing the entire build, which is something to take in mind, keep in mind. When you're building your hot rod, what's the next thing you're going to do? What's the next plan you have? Because, guys, let's be honest with each other. We're never done with it. We're always going to want more. And if you build it to 10 tenths, and there's not much more you can squeeze out of it with ma without major, major money, maybe you should change your plans. Maybe you should build it a little bit different. I could put a supercharger on this thing, on, E80, or on 93 octane, but I'd need to switch to aluminum heads. And by switching to aluminum heads in the Pontiac world, I'm at four or 5,000 bucks, at least, before I buy my supercharger kit something to keep in mind. Anyway, a lot of people are curious about this kind of stuff and a lot of people don't really talk about it. The Oldsmobile build that we build, I am super happy with that thing. That thing runs phenomenally well on 87 octane. And again, it's got plenty of headroom if that guy wants to get real rowdy and throw eight pounds of boost at it, still run on pump gas, make 700 plus horsepower on eight pounds of boost. It'd be hilarious. It's probably gonna break most everything else he has attached to it. But I believe that guy's actually already kind of planning ahead on that. He's got a transmission, he's got a rear end, so who knows what's happening with that. I don't know that I'll ever go any further with this car. To be honest with you, I might change the intake, I might change the carburetor on it, but I don't think I'll ever go for more power. So this one, I'm probably done with, but there's a good chance that I end up with a forced induction Pontiac at some time in the near future. And I need to keep that in mind and be honest with myself about my plans. Conversation to be had, guys. What do you build your hot rods for? What kind of fuel do you build your hot rods for? What kind of compression ratios do you run and on what types of fuel? Are you one of those guys that runs 10 and a half to one compression on cast iron heads and just say to hell with it and, and let it rock and roll, take the timing out as much as you can? Or are you somebody that tends to build things a little bit more on the safe side so you can enjoy it without having to worry about possibly blowing it up? There's a whole lot of different minds about this and I understand all of you. I'm just kind of curious. Host of the conversation. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm going to go play with my toys now that it's no longer raining. I want to see if I've got this thing figured out in my bog situation on the high RPM, whether or not it's gone. Or if I still need to do some more playing with my quadrajet. We'll see. That'll be for the next one. Take care, guys. If you've been here before, click on the subscribe button if you haven't already. If this is your one that you've been here before, if this is your very first video, welcome aboard. Hope to see you again on another video. Time to go play. I'll see you guys later. Take care. Bye-bye. Did I say play? I mean test. Definitely testing for science.